Hi, this is John with the Fossil Channel, and today I'm going to go over some casual magic decks that I have. Um, I'm a big fan of angels, and I have a mono white angel deck I'm going to go over with you. I'm going to start with the lands here. I have 13 planes, basic planes. I like to keep my basic planes count up. Uh, this is a mono white deck. Moving along, I have uh, Miss Veil vale planes. I like this particular card because uh, I find generally I have more than two permanents I'm in play, white permanents that is, and a lot of the times I do have permanents in the graveyard and I want to get to them uh, via tutoring or uh, just shuffling the deck with other effects. Uh, I have other cards that allow me to do that in this deck that we'll get to later on, but this can be extremely useful if someone's trying to snipe. Uh, certain cards that you want to resurrect or just want to play, like Surgical Extract You, you can use this ability as a response to save your hand and your card in the graveyard and in your deck. Um, the only problem is that it comes into play tapped and that you need two white permanents for it to work. Um, other than that, it's a decent card. Uh, it's not the best because it comes into play tapped. Again, it's kind of slow. It can really hurt you. So, that is the first land. Second land I have is uh, also comes into play tapped, which is uh, a negative as well. But this one allows me to take cards from my graveyard. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control seven or more planes, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Um, obviously, I'm running a high density of planes in this deck. I believe it's, even including Miss Vale Plains, it's 14. Um, I'm running land tax and scroll rack, so I can kind of shift through what I need to get this up to par. That's a long-range game plan. How often does it happen with this deck? Mm, not nearly as much as I want it to. I'd say about 25% of the time, uh, if that. Yeah, I still keep it in there because it's kind of a fun card and does concern people in the late game when I get to it. Next up are some legendary lands. I'm running Iganjo Castle. Now Iganjo Castle is good in that it doesn't come play tapped and it produces white mana. So that helps with getting out the correct color assortment from my creatures into play. Its ability is you tap one white, you tap this card, and prevent the next two damage to be dealt to target a legendary creature this turn. Now that can work for your ally, that can work for you, um, and you can save some of your creatures, and I've done this with this card before. Uh, I'm running Linvalo in this deck, so I can block and then use this card and say, okay, no damage to, prevent two damage to her. Um, only problem is it has to be a target legendary creature. Luckily, this deck makes use out of uh, a decent amount of legendary creatures, at least, the target with with this next up is all-time favorite of mine is Caracas um, you tap to have one white man to mind pool or you can tap this and return target legendary creature uh, even though it says legend on the card it's going to write it to say legendary creature uh, to owner's hand so this is extremely valuable in a number of reasons uh, I play it in death and taxes and legacy um, you can protect your own legendary creatures. Obviously, you can get rid of enemy legendary creatures. So, uh, that's pretty much the value of this card. And it's extremely, extremely powerful. Um, works well against Reanimator if they don't have an answer to this card. Next up is sort of a weird addition to this deck. I don't necessarily need it. I, I could run with 14 basic planes. However, um, I'm running balance in the deck, and I wanted something that could gain me a advantage if I did balance. And this particular card can. It says when flagstones of choke care is put into any graveyard from play, or a graveyard from play rather, you may search your library for a plants card and put it into play tapped. If you do, shuffle your library. Um, this can work with um, Admonition Angel. I'm running a couple of those in this deck and the trigger is, you know, you could sack this land to something or if it gets destroyed for any reason, 
uh, you'll have another trigger effect when the land comes into play. That's a minor thing, though. The main reason to have this in this deck is I do face a certain amount of land disruption uh, through destruction, and obviously the balance, which I stated before. That's the only reason why I'm running it in here. Otherwise, I could just run another planes. Um, it's a fun card. Uh, to really make use out of it, you want to run it more than one. I'm running one at the moment. Uh, I like to run a lot of one ofs in my casual decks because I like to see the card pop up. Uh, next up is a really annoying card for most Magic players. It is uh, Strip Mine. And basically, you could tab it to add one color mana to your mana pool, which I do that 50% of the time. And then 50% of the other time is um, I basically blow up your land. Uh, this will take care of Maze of Iths, uh, Caracuses, um, and some really crazy... Um, instances when I'm running balance, I'll destroy my own, um, I can even destroy flagstones, which is not really something I do, but if I need the land, the, uh, the landfall effect, uh, on Admonition Angel, that's something to do. It's really not the best play. In fact, it's something you don't want to do at all, usually. Um, but however, it's mainly an offensive card. Uh, it's just really annoying. That's why it's restricted to one in Vintage. So, obviously, this is not, you know, fun card to play against. Um, especially with Crucible of Worlds. I am not running that in this deck. I'm not that much of a cheese person to do that. <laughs> Next card is going to be uh, a pair of Mishra's Factories. Um, these are good early game for blocking, defending against those little 1-1 one -one creatures that chip away at me. Um... And I can boost my creatures up. Or if I do Wrath of God, uh, I still have a post-board presence to push damage. These are probably the only non... Um, well, technically, yes and no, non-angel creatures. that not necessarily a creature. You have to make them a creature. So, um, I run angel pure decks, which means um, I only have angel creatures in the deck. You could consider this a creature. Sure, uh, you could not. If you don't ever use it as a creature, it could just be a land. Um, I use it in both fashions, um, so that, that's probably the only non-angel creature, if you will, in the deck. Uh, I consider it just a land, so, um, yeah, it's a great card. You basically take one colorless mana or any kind of mana to turn it into a 2-2 creature. Um, it has some interesting, um, effects with its second ability where you can tap and give another assembly worker one plus one until end of turn. So you can do some kind of crazy uh, combat tricks with this. Uh, if, say, you attack into something that's a little bit stronger, like a 2-2 two -two with it, and you don't want to lose your land, uh, you could theoretically tap this, give this one plus one so it has extra health so that it doesn't die. Um, so that's interesting uh, with these cards. They're really effective cards. Um, there's other cards like Mutavolt out there. I don't have access to that. Um card so this i went with mistress factory and it's a little bit less expensive so uh these are fun cards they work well um and they do the job pretty well a couple uh, of other color lines that i've run in the deck are core haven um tap to add one colorless mana to your mana pool or its ability to tap one colorless mana or rather one of any kind of mana now uh and one white and you tap this card itself uh, so it's like three mana all together, or using three lands, rather. Um, and you can prevent all combat damage to be dealt by target attacking creature this turn. Uh, this card has saved me a lot in this deck for creatures that if they would connect, it would be really d disastrous for me. Um, it's sort of almost like a Maze of Ith, but it allows damage to be done to the creature that's attacking you, or... That, that's attacking. So you can really take out some creatures with this card, which is kind of interesting. And I find a lot of people forget that's on a table when I'm playing it, and I use it, and they're like, what? And I say, oh, well. And their day just gets that much sadder. Um, it's a great card. Uh, it makes colorless mana. That's why I run it instead of Maze of Ith. Next up is sort of a weird addition to the deck. Um, this is more of a uh, meta in the uh, pool of friends that I play with. Um, this is Phyrexian Tower. Now, I'm not running any black cards, so you're wondering, you know, why the hell would I run a card that makes black mana? 
Um, first, you can tap it for colorless mana, which is always good. Uh, second, you can sacrifice a creature to add two black mana to your mana pool. Now, I can power out other creatures with this if I need to, or if something is going to re remove my angel from the game, uh, I'd rather just blank the removal uh, in case they get any sort of benefit from it. Second, it gets the creature to my graveyard, which is where I want it uh, with this deck. So I always want things going to the graveyard, and this is a way to get them going to the graveyard instead of being removed from game. Um, or if uh, I have a friend who gains control of creatures, well, if he targets a creature of mine, I can just sack it in response, and that is sort of my answer to that problem. It's, uh, otherwise, it's not a card to run mono white, but for its utility in my group, that's why I'm running it. Next up, I have some artifacts here. Um, first one being a classic one. It's called Soul Ring. Everybody loves Soul Ring. Uh, tap to have two close mana to your mana pool. Uh, pay one to put it down, so it nets you a gain of one when you play it, as long as you're playing, if you can use the, the colorless mana. Um, great card. Uh, nothing else really to say about it. It's power level is insane. Next up is almost as equally annoying and powerful is Mana Volt. Uh, bring it into play for one mana. Tap to add three colors mana to your mana pool. Um, this does not untap during normally during your tap phase. Uh, you have to pay for mana during your upkeep if you want to untap this card. Otherwise, it remains tapped and deals one damage to you. Um, the drawbacks are minimal. Uh, I've played Baneslayer on turn two with this card, and it's pretty disgusting. Um, <laughs> the lifelink <laughs> negates the negative effects of the card. So, it has its ups and downs. I've lost, yes, I've lost games to the uh, one damage. Uh, maybe one out of every 20 games that I play, if that. Uh, it's a good card. It, it I I I like it as sort of mana acceleration for this deck, and that's what this deck needs when it's dropping a lot of angels. So that's Mana Volt, great card. Um, next up we have Sensei's Divining Top. I decided to add this in out when I when it became banned in Legacy and just put it into this deck. Um, I was looking for more um, drawing effects, top decking manipulations. Um, and it's one mana cost. So it can potentially fix a game for me if I have a crappy starting hand and I have this in it. I feel a little bit better playing with it and kind of predicting what I'm going to get on the top of the deck. Obviously, since his Divine Top is a big thing, was a big thing with uh, Miracles, um, no more. Um, so here it finds its home here in my uh, mono white deck. Uh, great card. Uh, Basically, you pay one mana, look at the top three cards of your library, then put the back in any order. Very powerful. Or And or, you can tap this, draw a card, and then put this card back on the top of its owner's library. So that's what Sensei's Divine Top does. Very Extremely powerful um, when used in the right kinds of decks. Uh, next card is equally, or not equally, but just as annoying. Um... Close to as annoying, because <laughs> you don't see it very much as you do seeing as you see Sensei's Divine and Top. Uh, this is Scroll Rack, two mana to cast. Uh, you pay one, you tap this card, you choose any number of cards in your hand, and you set those cards aside. You put an equal number of cards from the top of your library into your hand, then put the cards set aside from your original hand on top of your library in any order you want. So you can see how this card can allow me to dig for answers, um, lands, uh, creatures, threats, whatever. Uh, when I combine this with land tax, it becomes an extremely uh, powerful uh, deck manipulation tool. So uh, yeah, it's it's quite the powerhouse. Uh, it's worked very well with this deck. Uh, I haven't taken it out. I don't think I'm going to take it out. I like the land tax combo with this one. So that is Scroll Rack. Really good card. Uh, next up, we have a pair of Quicksilver Amulets. This is also part of the uh, idea of cheating in um, 
my cards into the game. Now, the reason why I went with this as opposed to like Belby's Portal, some other like, you know, janky way of either reanimating from the graveyard or whatnot to get my creatures into play, um, the mana cost to cast this is four. The cost to use it is also four. So it stands to reason if you have four mana available, you will be able to use this card. Belby's Portal is five mana and it takes three mana to use. Uh, long term, that's a better card because you'll probably have five mana long term if you make it to long term. This is a little bit quicker, short term gain. Um, you pay more to use it though. Uh, I like being able to put things out faster in this deck than slower because I already have a ton of slow cards in this deck. I don't need any more slower things. And four mana is a high casting cost. Um, uh, relative to this deck, that's actually kind of a low medium casting cost but in general for an artifact that does what it does that's a high casting cost i have to pair in here i do draw into them i don't necessarily need them to play the deck but they work very well next up is a sort of a fringe card which not a lot of players new players i should say are familiar with a lot of the old guys will know this one it's called nevin Norales disc and what it does is it's four mana of the cast it's an artifact and you, it comes into play tapped, even though it doesn't say on here. Or rather, it says at the bottom, but it, they changed the text later on. But basically, it comes into play tapped. In order to use it, you have to tap it and pay one. Destroy all creatures, enchantments, and artifacts in play. Now, the wording is very specific, and the order of operations is very specific on the card. So it's important to note that on this card. Um, I run with, uh, what's her name? Abyssin. Uh, basically the, the original absent says all your permanents indestructible so I can destroy wipe the board and keep all my stuff on the table with that card out and this card so it, it's extremely powerful um, great card uh, it's a answer all card and I do need board wipes with this deck Especially when I'm playing uh, tons and tons of creature decks versus me. Uh, I need an answer to wipe the board and reset. Because once I get into the mid to late game, this deck starts to shine. And this card helps me do that. That's why I have it in the deck. That's Never Norales Disc. Great card. Next up, we're up to the enchantments. Uh, I'm running three enchantments in the deck. Uh, first one I mentioned before is Land Tax. Uh, everybody's favorite uh, greedy dude stealing stuff <laughs> basically it's one white mana so you can put down turn one and what it says is during your upkeep if an opponent any opponent if an opponent has controls more land than you you may search your library and remove up to three basic land cards and put them into your hand reshuffle your libraries afterwards this is incredibly powerful in terms of me fixing my mana color um situation if i have too many colors mana or if i'm just low on planes for emeria or if I just need to get a shuffle effect in my deck, I will do that. Um, this is a great card for that. Works well with Scroll Rack and Sensei's Divining Top. So that's why I have it in the deck. And it's pretty much the only white mana uh, filtration system that I know of uh, that works fairly well. Uh, that being said, my deck's a great card. Moving on. We're looking at a set of two here in the deck. And this is called Oblivion Ring. Everybody's favorite or catch-all removal. Basically, it's one white and two colors enchantment. When it comes into play, it triggers an ability, which uh, you may remove another target non-land permanent from the game. When it leaves play, return that removed card to play under its own control. Uh, the utility of this card is vast. Uh, obviously, removing enemy targets, enchantments, artifacts, planes of walkers, creatures whatever tokens uh, or stowing away uh, your own creatures in case of a board wipe uh, like Nevenerals Disc. Again, you can get ahead like that and sometimes I might even use this on my own creature but that's a very rare uh, case. So that's Oblivion Ring, three mana cost uh, enchantment but extremely effective. Next up uh, we're going to instances and this is sort of a weird split you don't see this often but I have one Enlightened Tutor for one white mana. It's an instant. Search your library for an artifact or enchantment card and reveal that card from all players. Shuffle your library and put that revealed card back on top of it. Great card. You can find answers like 
Sol Ring or Manavolt for Man Acceleration or Land Tax. Um, I'm running, uh, what's that angel? Oh gosh. It's the one that you can't win the game. You can't lose the game and they can't win the game. Um, Platinum Angel. So I use that to search up Platinum Angel or Quicksilver Amulet to put out a big creature. Uh, it sort of, it pretty much doubles any of those cards, but you need a way to draw it, which I do have with Scroll Rack or, um, uh, Sensei's Divine Top. Uh, I have a split of three, not four, but three uh, Swords of Plowshares in the deck. So, uh, typical best white removal, probably the best removal in the game. One white mana, instant cost, uh, instant speed. Remove target creature from the game. That creature's control gains life equal to its power. This can work in your favor. This can save you from dying to burn if you plow your own creature, which is kind of weird, I know, but that's what it can do. Or it just completely removes another creature from the game. Great card, one white mana, definitely great early game. Gets me into late game. Very much needed in a deck like this. And that's Swords of Plowshare. Um, so that is the instances. Next up, we're going to go to Sorceries. Uh, I have three Sorceries in this deck. Uh, first one is Balance. It's very unbalanced, this card. Um, especially with a deck like this, where I don't play very much during the initial stages of the game. Meaning I can control the board at the cost of sacrificing my hand to control the board. That's essentially what it comes down to. In most cases, that's not a big deal. Um, <laughs> this card is extremely powerful. It gets around uh, hexproof. It uh, gets around targeting people. Um, I know the new uh, one of the first iterations of Sigarder, the first one, uh, Host of Herons, I think, um, this card won't work with her in play if she's on the enemy team. Uh, other than that, um, this is great. It equalizes. Basically, what it says is whichever player has more lands in play must discard enough lands to, of his or her choice to equalize the number of lands both players have. Next, equalize the cards in hand and then creatures in play in the same way. Creatures lost in this manner are considered buried. Um, they change that to sacrifice. So you can't regenerate things. You can't give it indestructible. So that's the nice thing about this card. It gets around all that nonsense. Um, and the order of operations is very important as well. Um, so there might be triggered abilities that go and whatnot in terms of the uh, effects of going into the graveyard or whatnot. Very important to pay attention to the order of operations. So that's balance. Very unbalanced card. Not fair. <laughs> Uh, next up, I have a pair of the classic Wrath of God. Um, this is White Signature, one of White Signature cards. Just blow everything up. All creatures are buried. That means destroyed without the possibility of being regenerated. This is this is an amazing card. Um, the newer iteration of this was Day of Judgment, uh, which destroys all creatures, but it doesn't have the uh, creatures cannot be regenerated clause in it like this card. So it's not as good as this card. Both same mana cost. It's two white, two color, two of any color. Cast at sorcery speed. Great card. I know uh, during Planet Shift, um, Black had a card like this called Damnation. Same thing, just shifted to the opposite color, which is a really great card in itself. Overall, this will help me uh, with balance and everyone's this in controlling the board and mass A um, and establishing a post board dominance uh if i can get to that phase uh which rarely happens but this card has saved my bacon a couple times in magic so uh, it's nothing to scoff at for mana it's a high casting cost but it gets me into the range of finally casting my angels uh that's wrath of god for you great card uh i'd highly recommend it if you want to make an angel deck next up we have the creatures now th these are going to change um with the advent of dominaria coming out uh, i want to get lyra dawnbreaker in here and uh shilali uh, voice of plenty uh, so these are going to be changed in the future uh, but right now I'm starting out with Linvala uh, Keeper of Silence now uh, she's two white and two colors she's a very powerful card she's a legendary angel uh, she has flying she's 3-4 activated abilities of creatures your opponents control can't be activated that is a very powerful card that stops a lot of things, and it can save you and buy you a lot of time. The fact that she's a 3-4 for 4 mana and flying means you can also hit 
and avoid the one more common removal is Lightning Bolt. So, yeah, she's a great card. She shuts down a lot, lots of decks. Sometimes she's used in Legacy as a control card too. Um, just a great card overall. Uh, can't can't stress enough. You got to have this in your Angel deck if you make an Angel deck. Next up, we have Archangel Avison. Um, basically, uh, I'm not using her for a flip ability in the deck, so it's not really relevant. Um, what is relevant is that she has Flash, uh, she has Flying, and she has Vigilance. And uh, a, a fourth ability on the card is when she enters the battlefield, uh, creatures you control gain in indestructibility until end of turn. So if somebody wants to wipe your board and you have the mana open to use this card, or if you have, let's say, Quicksilver Amulet, you can flash this in and save your creatures. Uh, very powerful card. Uh, it's just amazing for for what it does. Um, at 4-4 four, four for Flying, Vigilance, Flash, 5 mana, 2 white, and 3 of any color, it's decent. Uh, when you tack on the other abilities and whatnot, it's pretty good. Um, it also says when a non-angel creature you control dies, transform Archangel Absent at the beginning of the next upkeep. I don't have any non- angel creatures in this deck other than my Meester's Factories. So this rarely, if never, gets turned up. Um, so it's not really that relevant. I'm not looking at the 6-5 uh, flip side of this card. Although I can do that, it's not that important. So that's Archangel Avacyn. Next up, I have Avacyn, Angel of Hope. Uh, same, same character, but the first iteration. Um, she's three white, five color, five of any color, uh, legendary angel, eight, eight flying and vigilance. And then this is the other important part. She has, uh, and other permanents I control are, indest are indestructible. So basically she's indestructible and other permanents that I control are indestructible. Again, this combos very well with Nevin Rule's disc. Um, she's a hoser. When she comes into play, she changes the game immediately for me. And she's an instant, um, well, Almost all these angel cards are instant magnet removals. Uh, that's what's nice about these cards is that every time I put down an angel, it's a threat. Uh, she's a great card for eight mana. Awesome in this deck. I love her in the deck. Uh, you got to have one in your deck if you're going to make an angel deck. Next up is Iona, Shield of Maria, uh, a popular reanimator target uh, in certain conditions in Legacy. Uh, at nine mana, three white, and six of any color, she's flying. She's a seven seven. And as she comes into play, uh, choose a color. Your opponents, more than one opponents, which is important, can't cast spells of the chosen color. So if I'm playing this in two head giant, this can effectively almost shut down the other team, uh, let alone the single player who's playing the color I choose. Obviously, very powerful effect. Flying 7-7, seven, seven, she can swing in and hit. Uh, obviously, downside is 9 mana. It's a huge cost. But if I'm playing... You know, ways to cheat it in. Uh, Sol Ring, Mana Volt, uh, just even to cast her fairly, she works very well. Uh, very powerful. That's shutting down someone's color. That, you, you can win games off that, and I have won games off that. And that's pretty much all I have to say about Iona. Next up is a subpar card, considering there's other better options out there. But since this is an Angel deck, and Angels only, this is Rhea Dawnbringer. Um, She's 9 mana, 3 white, 6 of any color, flying 4-6. Uh, considerably weaker than Iona for the same cost. So that's kind of power creep right there. Um, however, she has a clause. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to play. Now well, that's important. Uh, especially if I want coming into play battle effects. Um... I have the multicolored deck version of this, and I use uh, Angel of Despair and Firexion Tower, and I'll sack Angel of Despair at the end of the opponent's turn, and then at the beginning of upkeep, I can grab my Angel of Despair, pop it back into play, destroy another permanent. But that's not in my one 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 deck that I'm discussing here. So that's my reasoning for having this card, is getting creature cards in my graveyard to get them back. So if I get milled, and I run into this card in my hand, and I'm able to put it out with Quicksilver Amulet at the end of the opponent's turn. That's fine with me. I'd rather have my creatures in the graveyard where I can pick them up. So, obviously, that's the benefit of running this card. 
other than that, she's just subpar. Flying four six for nine mana is is really bad. That's just there's so many better options out there. Uh, the second clause is really why I'm running her, and I, I if it was an angel deck, obviously I run better cards, but it's an angel deck. She fits the uh, ability I want to use her for, and that's it. That's Rhea. Next up, we, we're coming to the regular cards. Uh, I mentioned this one earlier. I have a Platinum Angel here. I have one of. Um, I can tutor it with Enlightened Tutor. Uh, it says, for seven mana of any color, uh, flying 4-4, four, four, which is not that great, but she says you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. That is extremely annoying, uh, especially when holding out against other decks. I've played games where uh, in 2 out of Giant, my friend was milled and... Uh, you couldn't draw any more cards effectively and would have lost the game. However, I had this out and, and stated that we couldn't lose the game. And we managed to win the game against, I think, like three other teams of two out of giant people. It was a great, fun, big, huge fight game that we had. So this card is a classic. Um, you can do a lot of shenanigans with the card. Um, I can get her back in play. I can protect her in vulnerability, uh, or rather indestructibility. Um, getting it to survive is the key. So, uh, must answer card. I mean, there's nothing else to say about it. I mean, I can swing in four damage. I've won games like that too. Not that I wouldn't, <laughs> I can end games that like that rather. Uh, again, classic, uh, classic card, platinum angel. Great card to have in an angel deck. Next up, I have a pair uh, of flex slots in the four mana cost section. And these are sublime archangels. Uh, they're more effective in token decks, but how we're at four mana for four three with flying and exalted and other creatures I control have exalted. That's what it does. Um, it can turn my uh, five five bane slayer into six six or a seven seven because the multiple uh, exalted effects trigger separately. So yes, it can really, really do alpha strikes with one card in this deck, and that's what this deck is about. It's not attacking and masse with creatures. It's made to get the most value out of individual cards. So it's a bunch of individuals working together. Uh, the angel, this angel actually provides sort of a area of benefit or, or beneficial aura, if you will, to the deck. That's why I have her in this slot. I'm thinking about taking her out and putting in, um, Lyra Dawnbringer and Shilali when I get her, uh, just for experimental sake. Um, I might relegate these to the sideboard and take out my Emeria uh, Angels instead, but we'll see. So that's Sublime Archangel. She's really powerful, especially in Tokens deck, but she's an angel nonetheless, and she can find a home in my angel deck. She does a very well, very good job at doing that here. So I have a pair of her here. Next up, I have another pair of four mana costing uh, angels, and they're called Archangel of Tights uh, for three white and one of any color. So it's a little bit harder to cast if you have a problem with colors mana. Now, uh, this card is interesting because it's a 3-5 flying creature, which already makes it a great body. It evens out. Um, now, the interesting thing with this one is, as long as this card is untapped, creatures can attack you or Planeswalker you control, which is important, unless the controller pays one for each of those creatures. Um, the second part of it says, as long as Archangel of Tice is attacking... Creatures can't block unless the controller pays one for each of those creatures. Now, that's interesting. If you want to play tokens, uh, you that really kind of drives home the effect on this one. And at four mana, it's pretty powerful. Um, it does die. Any of these cards really die to removal on this deck. Uh, but when you're trying to slow down people from attacking you, this is why I use this card. Um, I could use other cards like Windborn Muse, which is a little bit more effective, or Ghost Prison. However, those are not angel cards, and one of them is an enchantment. Um, I don't run too many enchantments in this deck. I could run Ghostly Prison, but I want to keep the count of creatures a little bit higher so I can make the most out of my Quicksilver Amulets. Um, so that's my reason for using Archangel of Tights in this deck. And as a pair, I find it's pretty pretty good and it comes out when I need it and I draw it when I need it usually um, as opposed to drawing something else better uh, so that's Archangel of Tights next up is everybody's classic uh, Wallet Slayer I mean Bane Slayer um, 
This is a crazy card for its mana cost. Uh, obviously, it's two white and three of any color. It's a 5-5 five, five with flying. So right there, uh, it's evened out. It has first strike, which pitches over the edge. A life ink, which really makes it ridiculous. And then just to add you know, insult to injury, it does. It has protection from demons and dragons. Now, that's a niche thing, but in some cases, when I'm fighting down a grizzle brand or... Um, you know, some kind of hell kite, uh, this card really does shine. So, uh, not much or else to say. I mean, look at Sarah Angel. She's two white, three colors, or three colored, or any color, or rather any kind of mana, flying four forward vigilance. Uh, this card trumps that immensely, and Sarah Angel was considered pretty powerful back in the old days. This is just power creep right here. Great card. Don't lean home without it unless you, you know, when you're making your angel deck, so. Bane Slayer Angel, and I have four of those in the deck. Another interesting card, which is a little bit different than Lifelink, um, it hasn't been errated or changed yet, which is unfortunate, but uh, is Exalted Angel. Uh, it's two white and four of any color. Uh, flying, four, five. So it's not great in terms of today's power structure for you know value and casting costs and what it does. However, uh, the interesting thing is when it deals damage, you gain that much life. Now, this doesn't work on the same triggering level as, uh, well, it's a triggered ability. It's not a uh, lifelink. Lifelink just happens. Uh, this one, it triggers so you could die from lethal damage it, despite the uh, gaining life off this, that you would gain life. You would die first before the triggered ability resolves. So it's important to note that with this card. I know it's kind of lame, but I've been waiting for them to change that to lifelink. They haven't changed it. That being said, if you give this lifelink with Liar Dawnbringer, not only are you going to gain four life initially from the lifelink, but then you're going to gain another four off this ability on the card. Now, why I'm running this card in this deck is the secondary ability, which is Morph. Uh, you play this face down as a 2-2 creature. That's it for three mana. Nobody knows what it is, and most people who don't play my deck or this deck won't know what to think of it. So it can attract uh, removal right away, which helps me get Baneslayer out, or on turn four, uh, I can I can put this out theoretically on turn two and get it out swing on turn three with Mana Vault. Um, this card is amazing in terms of its speed, and really the main reason to play this card is because you get down to play for three of any mana, on the fourth turn you're swinging with a four five that gains you life. That This has saved me games, this has enabled me to get out early defense, um, just a great card overall, and the fact that Morph doesn't use the stack, you can do it whenever you want, and nobody can respond to the Morph. Uh, morphing it is going to cost two white and two colors, so obviously by turn four, you should, in this deck, I found myself having that kind of mana to do that, just precisely that. So it's a very effective card, very annoying. Uh, all my friends know what it is now, because they play this deck, but people who don't play this deck won't know what it is. Uh, extremely fun card. Uh, I would recommend it in the uh, Angel deck for sure. Uh, the next two cards is a playset of Admonition Angel. Now, Admonition Angel um, reflects out of six mana casting cost slot, and uh, can, you can run different cards. You can run Twilight Angel, depending on what you want to do. I like this one because it improves my uh, single target board control, and I have won games with this card out. Um, Obviously, if you're running this card, you want to use Fetchlands too. I don't use Fetchlands in this deck because I need the basic planes count high. Um, that being said, uh, if I did run Fetchlands in this deck, it might make it will definitely make this better. However, as it stands, this is fine when I'm using Scroll Rack and Land Tax because I'm always going to be gaining mana in that in that sense. Um, it's not as consistent as say, obviously a Fetchland. However, uh, I digress. This is six mana, uh, three white, three of any color, flying, six six, great body for mana cost and ability right there. Secondary stuff, landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may exile a target non-land permanent other than Admonition Angel. Extremely useful. Um, when Admin Angel leaves the battlefield, return all cards exiled with it to the battlefield under their owner's control. Uh, again, great effect. I can take out enemy enchantments, artifacts, planeswalkers, Whatever permanent, non-land permanent I want, gone with this card. This this is my answer to 
anything that stops me from attacking like Ensnaring Bridge or a myriad of other cards. Uh, you know, my friend uses Propaganda. And get rid of it with this card. I don't have to go for my O-Rings. So, great card. Recommend it if you want board control. Uh, there's other better cards to put in the 6 mana slot, uh, depending on what your uh, your meta is. Uh, last pair of cards I have here are Angel of Serenity. Um, it's 7 mana, 3 white, 4 colors, and it has flying. When it comes into play, you may exile up to 3 other target creatures from the battlefield and or creature cards from graveyards. When Angel Serenity leaves the battlefield, return the exiled cards to their owner's hands. Um, it's a 5-6 flying for 7 mana. Decent body, not the best uh, equal ratio for casting costs, but its other abilities make up for that. This can win you games single-handedly. You can stop reanimated targets. Um, I won games off this card, even just swinging. It's, a, it's basically a four turn clock if they haven't gained life or lost life um great card uh, i recommend it if you want to enhance your creature removal and graveyard hate that's why i run it in this deck so that's angel serenity now uh we're gonna go over some uh, cards in my sideboard this is always changing so these aren't permanent but uh based on what i have and on i kind of go with the flow so first one is uh an artifact elixir of immortality Sometimes early game, I need to gain life. This is my fastest way of gaining life without changing the color that I need to use the item. So I can run this off colors mana, which is important. Um, the other important part is that if I want to avoid my cards from being taken or removed from the game in the graveyard, I'll shuffle everything back into the library, and then I can go searching for them with Enlightened Tutor. Uh, great card. Uh, gives you five life, and it keeps you from getting milled, Importantly, most importantly. Uh, next up, another O-Ring. So I have three in the deck. And then now I have some creatures here. Emory Angels. I'm going to trade these out for uh, Shilali and um, Lyra Dawnbringer. So, but right now they're the only card that can make Avacyn flip with the non-Angel Claws. They're two white, uh, two colors. Creature, Angel, 3-3, three, three, Flying, Decent. Uh, landfall, whenever land enters the battlefield, I can put a 1-1 one, one White Bird token with flying onto the battlefield. So I can generate chump blockers and chump attackers with this card and clog up the board state. Uh, yeah, it's a great card for four mana. It's really, really not bad. I've, I've used it before in the main deck and it has done well, um, but I'm looking for something a little bit different uh, with my deck now. So I'm going to take these guys out. But it's a decent card. Emery Angel, not not bad. Next up is uh, sort of a winning card on its own if you can have it connect. It's called Blinding Angel. Um, basically it's two white, three of any color, flying two, four. So it's got a subpar body with the mana cost. However, when it deals combat damage to a player, that player skips his or her next combat phase. I can't tell you how many times this has saved me from goblins, uh, rampaging elves, looking to reclaim their forest. <laughs> um, this has stalled the game so much for me that I've won off of it. So that's why I keep it in the sideboard in, in case I'm running into, um, a lot of creatures attacking me so uh if i can have it connect great it works very well uh so that's blinding angel a great card overall uh next up is a classic for combos and whatnot but i use it strictly for its vigilance and attack damage and then uh its ability uh it's two white four of any color uh flying vigilance four five so it's about even uh for the casting quest i i find it uh, when target creature other than a darker Valkyrie is put into a graveyard this turn, return that card under to play under your control. So I can steal stuff from the other guys, or I can get uh, my uh, uh, Twilight Shepherd or whatever whatever card of mine that goes to the graveyard. If I sack it with Phyrexian Tower, I get it back again. So uh, I can save it from being removed from the game. I can save it from being gained control of. I can do a whole bunch of things and plus that this card has vigilance it means i can swing into somebody and still save that ability for their turn so it's extremely extremely effective card great card uh darker vacry i don't uh, i recommend that in a mono white build um next up is a singleton of angelic arbiter i'm thinking about taking this card out um i'm not too keen on keeping it in here i rarely in practice i've rarely used it to full effect 
Um, it's two white, five colorless, or five of any color, rather. Uh, it's flying five, six for seven mana. Uh, it's okay. It's not the best body for the casting cost, but what it says is each opponent who ha who had uh, each opponent who cast a spell this turn cannot attack with creatures. Each opponent who attacked with a creature this turn can't cast spells. Now, uh, obviously, I'm not meaning to directly hard cast this. I mean to cheat in with Quicksilver Amulet. So I can catch them on their turn with Quicksilver Amulet and saying, okay, you cast a spell, that means you can't attack any of your creatures. So I can further stall the board, and she's a 5 6 flying, so she, she can be a beat stick on her own. Uh, excellent card for what it could do in theory in practice i find it a little bit lackluster so i've relegated it to sideboard um area uh so i'm probably gonna switch that sooner or later um next up is an interesting card i've won games off of too um she's also definitely sideboard i did have her in the main deck uh sometimes i change that up is a chroma angel of wrath um she costs three white mana and five of any color she has flying first strike trample Haste, protection from black, protection from red, and vigilance. And she's a 6-6. Six, six. So, uh, she's just an efficient beat stick. Especially against the colors that she has protection from, black and red. Uh, you're going to win. Um, hands down, she's one of the best combat angels I've ever seen. Um, with all those abilities on it. So she can protect herself in, to a certain degree. Which is valuable. Um, I use her. Sometimes the main board and I can win games off of her um, as a surprise, uh, especially with um, Quicksilver Amulet. Like, I'll do a Quicksilver Amulet, uh, a basic creature at the end of their turn. Then I'll do another Quicksilver Amulet on my turn and put her into play so I can really uh, push the damage through and put them into critical mass. Um, great card, especially against black or red, obviously. So that's a Chroma Angel of Wrath. Uh, next up, I have a pair of Resolute Archangels. Uh, two white, five of any color, flying four four. So it's not a very good uh, co uh, converted casting cost for the body and flying. However, when it enters the battlefield, if your life total is less than your starting life total, it becomes equal to your starting life total. So, um, in two headed giant, that's kind of interesting uh, and annoying. Um, single player, not as much, but the effects of two headed giant, it's you get ten more life, so it's a good reset. Um, I find myself flashing that in with Quicksilver Amulet or just pulling it as a surprise on my own uh, turn just to stall the game long enough that I can get my damage through. Uh, that being said, it's an okay card. Uh, in practice, it, it's about even fair for, for me and my deck and when I've used it. Um, the rewards are pretty pretty balanced with it. So it's a great card, um, in my opinion, then. Uh, it's fun to use, fun to pull out. And the artwork's really nice, especially with the two foil versions that I have here. Um, so that's Resolute Archangel. Uh, decent card. You can throw it in your Angel deck if you're looking for budget options. Another uh, Angel card, which is equally as annoying, is I have a pair of Pristine Angels. Um, so it's two white, four of any color. It's a flying 4-4. Four, four. Um, so it's okay uh, for the converted mana cost. But it's uh, what it does is interesting. Um, as long as it's untapped, it, ha it has protection from artifacts and all colors. Whenever you play a spell, you may untap Pristine Angel. Um, so if I play my Enlightened Tutor, uh, Swords of Plowshares, in response to anything that tries to remove this card, uh, I can untap her and it, it'll fizzle out anything that goes after her. Um, this is this is a good card to have because um, I run into uh, the JIT a lot. And the JIT is an artifact, and they can't target this as long as it's untapped. Um, which is really nice to have because then, you know, you can stop damage from incoming and uh, you can push damage with this card. And that's why I run with two of those. And that's my answer for anything that has a nasty color um color balance to it or rather if i'm facing like red and black i'll throw this in with a chroma so now i have a little bit more of a anti black or red uh cards uh the last card i have here uh, i left it in my box here but it was supposed to be the second card i was go through um is umazawa's jete um this is this is an annoying card uh speaking of which from pristine angel um 
it's not as needed in this deck. I would say in a deck that does white weenie, like my Death and Taxes deck, my Legacy deck, it's really, really effective, especially when you're running Stoneforge Mystic. Um, but the card itself is a great card to answer a lot of things, and um, it's, a, it's a multiple flexible card. It's two of any color mana, it's an artifact equipment, and it says whenever equipped creature deals combat damage, that's important to note, combat damage, uh, put two charge counters on Umazawa's Jete. Remove a charge counter from Umazawa's Jete. Choose one of the following. The equipped creature gets 2 plus 2 until end of turn. Or target creature gets negative 1, negative 1 until end of turn. Or you gain 2 life. Equip cost is 2. The uh, the reason why this card is seen in a lot of competitive decks and legacy um, is that it's an amazing card it just does too much and if you do get counters on this card you will probably end up winning the game uh, my experience with this card in my uh, green white black maverick legacy deck and my death and tactics deck this card is a powerhouse i'm telling you that the especially um in competitive scenes it's it's a it can be a game changer definitely in this deck in the mono white angels deck that i have here if my angels can survive, yes. Um, that's the that's the issue. It's always been the issue with equipment. If the creature can live, um, I can't put it on my pristine angel uh, because she has protection from artifacts, <laughs> so I can't target it. However, uh, if I put it on a chroma or any of my other angels, it, it'll work. Especially with a first strike clause. That's the key with this card. First strike. This will get the counters, and you can use its ability before the regular combat damage is done. That's the nice thing about JIT. So if you have Mirian Crusader, uh, you know, speaking from Death and Taxes or Maverick, uh, this card can end the game very fast. Uh, here in Mono White Angels is not as um, effectively used. It's a good card. I'm thinking about switching this out for another Angel or probably another um, Mana Source. Uh, I'll, I'll figure out something in the future. So that is my Mono White uh, Angel's deck, my first iteration of building an all-Angel deck, um, if you don't count the Mishra's Factory. Uh, so that that's what I've been playing for the past few years and updating. Uh, I can't wait till Shilali comes out. Uh, Shilali, Voice of Plenty, and Lyra Dornbringer, and throw her into this deck and see how it plays. Um, so that's my uh, Mono White Angel deck. I'm going to make another video in the future about my other Angel decks, but right now, that's all I got. Uh, thanks for watching. This is John with the Fossil Channel.